one name and one name only that's lifted. That's the name of Jesus. So we set ourselves aside right at the beginning of this year and at what we believe is the outset of a new era in you, for your church. We say, Jesus, may you be glorified. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Minister to every individual, young and old, hungry for you. We pray that this night would be a transforming night. For each and every one of us, we've come hungry and expectant to receive from you. I pray that you would anoint every word that's spoken, every decision that's made, everything that's done, so that it will be to your glory and yours alone, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, welcome to Vision Launch 2015. So good to see so many of you. We're going to switch things up, do things a little bit different because I believe people are going to walk away from this place having encountered God in such a real way by the end of this. And it's, this is no ordinary night. Uh, this is a night for an encounter with God. Uh, as we launch this vision, this is not just a practical, programmatic vision launch tonight. Uh, that would be to lower what God wants to do in this place to the ordinary programming of everyday church life. I really feel that God wants to speak to each one of us tonight. If you're visiting us, wow, what a great night you picked to be in church. And we as Edge Church are so privileged that you took the time to come and join us. It's great to have you with us. We want you to feel very welcome. We don't want you to feel like you have to do anything, but you are more than welcome. Welcome to our family. We really are a family and we're here to serve our community with a message that brings hope, truth and love to individuals' lives. And we're all testimonies of people who are broken, who discovered an amazing God. And He brought a message of hope, truth and love into our lives, changed us forever. And we're so grateful that you would give us the privilege to share that message with you. It's not about a religion or an institution. It is about one and one only, and that is the name of Jesus. And we're so grateful that you took the time to be with us tonight. Hey, let's give all of our visitors a big welcome. It's great that you're here. Hey, to our young people, why don't you guys make your way back to your seats. Say day to someone before you take your seats. High five someone. That would be great. Adelaide kind of welcome to our Melbourne family that are watching live on screen right now on our Melbourne campus. Adelaide family won't give them a big, big welcome to Ben and to the team, Crystal, and to the team there. We actually launched uh, the vision last Sunday in our Bristol campus, had an incredible time in Bristol. Prior to that, I was five days in Zimbabwe having a look at our work uh, there with uh, World Vision as well, and it was just incredible. Uh, time there as well and uh, I heard that David Spears is here who's a uh, local member of our community um, and he's uh, he came along with us to Zimbabwe wherever you are David welcome it's great to have you with us a leader in our community he's somewhere here um, but it's great to have you with us and uh, it's going to be an encouraging night for you tonight I pray that you would open your hearts to what God might want to say to you this evening uh, don't come expecting an ordinary vision launch, because I haven't come expecting ordinary. I just want to share for those of you that are new to our vision on, in November last year, we did a pre-vision launch as we launched this theme of one as a church, one church, one vision, one mission, one God, one purpose, one people, one baptism, one doctrine, one belief, all of us coming together as one. And of course, year one of a new era, um, because we believe we're not just building another season. And I, I actually believe 2015's theme is not just for 2015. I believe that we are building for an era, not just for 12 months. We're building for an era. Um, and the theme of one came out of Joshua chapter 6. I'm not going to read from it tonight. But Joshua chapter 6, when the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho for six days, 
And on the seventh day, they shouted and the walls came down. And I really felt God dropped this thought into my mind that it was time for us to come together as one. And I specifically focused this era and this season on the first six days of that journey uh, where the people had to learn to walk as one, trust as one, obey as one, think as one, and walk in unity before they could shout as one. And I believe that God spoke to me about a season of silence. We're hearing as we began to speak about this season of silence, understanding a season of silence is not about inactivity. A season of silence is about focused activity. The only difference between the six days and the seventh day was the fact that on the seventh day they walked seven times and then they shouted, but on the six days they still walked, they were still active. We can't misunderstand the season of silence as being a season of inactivity. No, a season of silence is a season of focused activity for us. Uh, our focused activity in 2015 is going to be in two areas, focused mentoring and focused mission. Very simple. This is all you're going to get of practicalities tonight, the next couple of minutes. And then I want us to lift our vision even higher beyond the vision of a church or an institution. I want us to lift our vision even higher. But focused mentoring. I discovered that in Jesus' three years of ministry, he didn't build a, an institution. He didn't he didn't, he didn't build himself a platform or a, or a throne. Or they were expecting him to build palaces and kingdoms. What he did was he built people outside of the obvious of his death and his resurrection, which gives us life. The greatest gift that he left behind for us was the people that he raised and discipled. And he raised them and discipled them and then commissioned them to go and make disciples. The very reason why this message continues is because they took on the commission to make disciples. We need focused mentoring. And God spoke to me out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul is encouraging Timothy. And he says, Timothy, my dear son, be, be, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. You've heard the things that I've taught you, Timothy. Now teach these things to other trustworthy people who can teach them to others. The Apostle Paul in another passage says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, don't imitate the parts of me that don't resemble Christ, but the parts of me that do imitate those parts. And the Apostle Paul's giving us a picture here of what it means to build Christians. Christ ones. As the Apostle Paul says, there's Christ and my eyes are set on him. For me, living means living for Christ and dying is gain. I want to live for Christ. I want to preach Christ and him crucified. And so I'm going to imitate Christ. Timothy, you imitate me. Timothy, I want you to raise trustworthy people that will take the teachings I've taught you and teach them to others. This is the progressive journey of focused mentoring so that all of us are not following a man. All of us are following Christ because the Apostle Paul said, I'm, imitate me as I imitate Christ. This vision is not about you following me or an eldership or a staff. This is about a staff and an eldership and a leadership that are following Christ. So follow them as they follow Christ. And we need to raise those who are trustworthy with this message who can raise others. There's so much in this that I want to unpack over the next couple of months about the way that we're going to work with discipleship, partnership, leadership, eldership, and lordship of Christ, which I'm not going to unpack tonight. But God is speaking to me clearly about the journey of leadership in our church and discipleship in our church. Focus mentoring. And the second thing will be focused mission. Our ride for hope is not just an event. Our ride for hope is not just a fun day. What I experienced in Zimbabwe, what I saw in Zimbabwe through the work of World Vision, and this is not a World Vision ad, but what I went looking for was not someone who would provide aid, but someone who would provide sustainability and empowerment to local people to be who they're called to be. You'll hear the story of a young man called Washington who was given $200 through a Channels of Hope program World Vision runs. Rather than give him $200 to buy food for himself, they trained him and empowered him to use the $200 to start a business. In six weeks, he turned $200 he bought chickens and began to breed them and raised 1,186 chickens, sold 1,100 of them for $8 US per head, and in six weeks made $8,800. He used the, stay with me, it cost him $3,500 to, 
to, to feed the chickens and grow the chickens. So we took the remaining $5,000 and bought a machine that would grind maize, the staple diet of the Zimbabweans. They would come from the community now. This all happened only two months ago. They all come from the community and pay a dollar a bucket to grind their maize. So now the community is being served, so now he's running two businesses. He's using the profits from the grinding of the maize, and he started a pig farm, and now he's running three businesses. He's totally self-sustained, and he's literally transforming his community and making more money than the people that would earn in a year. Why? Because of empowerment. Now, if $200 can transform a whole community. What can happen if an army of people realise the power of one and 2,000 people raise $500 and we put a million dollars towards empowerment and transforming communities? You'll see a documentary that will come out in the next four to six weeks or so. I'm going to dedicate a whole night to explaining the mission of our church. We could all go and do our own mission. We could all go and do our own thing, but there's power in our unity. There's power in one, which you're going to understand this evening. There's power in our coming together. It's not about control. It's about God's commanded blessing. He declares it over where brethren dwell together in unity. It's focused mission. And of course, we have One Nation One Day that we're doing with missions.me to transform a whole nation in a day with churches from across the globe. We have 41 people currently signed up and paid their deposits to go to the Dominican Republic in July. Those 41 people are studying Spanish right now so that they can speak to people about Jesus in Spanish. It's, it's incredible what God is doing. Emissions Stop Me have already gone in there and we literally will see a nation changed in a day as the church comes together as one, as we push down the brands of our churches and the brands of our denominations and just decide across the globe to walk hand in hand into a nation, take 20 states, take 20 stadiums, bring the message of the gospel, every Every TV station, every radio station, and see a nation change in a day. Can a nation be changed in a day? I'd like to say that we are part of a generation that can say yes. Focus mission as a church, but that's not where I want to focus tonight. We'll do focus mentoring and focus mission, and you'll hear a lot more about that. I just want you to drop the thoughts of the institution of church for a moment. The program you might have been expecting tonight, the details of stuff you might have thought about tonight. And I just want you to lift your eyes and realize there is a greater vision for your life than for you to just make it to heaven. There's actually a greater purpose for your life than just to build the church. There's actually a greater purpose for you as an individual. You need to catch this. A greater purpose for you as an individual than just to make your way through an ordinary life, build an ordinary church, get to heaven and scrape our way in. That is not God's purpose for your existence. I wanna ask you the big question. Why are you here? Why were you born? Why do you exist? Why do you live and why do you breathe? Have you ever asked yourself the question, because the whole world's on the search of this, why do you live and breathe? I dare to try and answer that question in the next few moments. And if you can stay with me in the first 15 minutes of this, it will start to unpack and you'll watch like a jigsaw. You'll watch pieces start to come together and then you'll realize the power of one and you'll realize very much just like I did that I couldn't put this together. This has got to be God taking us one step at a time on our journey prophetically as a church. Are you ready to lift your eyes? Yes. Ephesians, sorry, Genesis chapter 2 Verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. There was no life until God breathed into man. Mankind is the only part of creation that carries the very breath of God inside of them. Uh, you and I, not like any other part of creation, have God's breath breathed into our nostrils. And when the breath came, life came, the very life of God came into our bodies. The very, <sighs> every time you breathe, that breath comes from the life of God. I want you to understand that because God gave us life with the intention that we would use all of it to worship him. Now, when I talk about worship, I'm not talking about singing. I'm talking about a constant lifestyle of worship. I'll unpack that in a moment. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness 
into his wonderful light. God gathered you as his chosen people, his royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. He gathered you for the purpose that you would declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. The purpose for your living, breathing existence is that you would praise God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, let me unpack this just for a few more moments. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ. A plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. So he's about to reveal the mystery. Why send Jesus? What, what is this all about? Why do we exist? Why was mankind created? Why did he breathe into us? It says this, and this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together as one. Under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united, one, with Christ, we've received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. He does not exist for our plan. We exist for his plan, and I'm going to unpack it a little bit more. God's purpose, here it is, this is the reason, was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. The very purpose for your existence, the very purpose for my existence is that every part of our life, every living, breathing moment would exist to bring worship and glory to God. And now, you Gentiles, the rest of us, the non-Jews, have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so. Again, the reason for this, the purpose for this. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. He did this so that we would use the breath he put inside of us to bring worship and glory to God. Now again, it's not about what I say or what I sing only. That's a part of it. Breath brings life. So what he's saying is the life I gave you exists for the sole purpose of bringing worship, praise and glory to God. He created us not so that he could serve us, but so that we could serve him. He created us so that we would bring worship and glory to him. Now this is critical. To describe worship is to lower ourselves in order to elevate someone else. When we worship a person, when we worship an institution, we lower ourselves and elevate the other. To worship God is to lower ourselves in order to elevate God. The posture of our life is that we would decrease so that he might increase. Now John the Baptist declared this in John chapter 3 verse 30. He said he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. And it was John the Baptist that ushered in the coming of Christ. The church that is going to usher in, the generation and the era that is going to usher in the coming of Christ is a generation and an era that desires to become less and less so that he could become greater and greater. This is not about him beautifying and making my life better. This is about me discovering my purpose in God and discovering that I was given breath in my lungs. <sighs> every time I breathe, every living moment, every dream, every desire, every plan that I make, every crisis, every victory, every part of my marriage, my family, my parenting, my business, my finance, every part of my life, every living, breathing moment is designed that I would bring glory to God, worship to God. Stay with me. The opposite of worship is to desire equality with God. Stay with me as I unpack this. So in Isaiah chapter 14, it talks about the devil. And it says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You've been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountains of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high to desire equality with God. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. The devil, formerly an angel, where it said that his body was made up of musical instruments, he was the worshipper of worshippers, came to a place 
where he chose no longer to lower himself in order to elevate God, desired equality with God and was cast out. Him and a third of heaven's angels were cast down. And from that moment when man was created, he desired also that he would confuse us with the same idealism that we would desire equality with God that we would not fulfill the purpose that God created us for, and that purpose was that we would worship God. And so when you come to Genesis chapter 3, it says this, Genesis chapter 3. You're very quiet out there, but that's okay. I know it's really loud in Melbourne right now, but I know that you're catching up with me. Just stay with me on this thought. Genesis 3 verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say to you, you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was convinced. Just paint this picture for you. The angel that was set aside for worship was one of the worshippers. Worshipper of worshippers decides he will no longer worship because he desired equality with God. God takes him and a third of his followers and casts them down. Mankind is created and God says, I'm going to put my breath in them. And the purpose of me putting my breath in them is so that they will worship me. So the enemy comes and not only did he steal a third of God's worshipers from heaven, he now desired to steal God's worship from your lips and from your life. And we were convinced. And sin entered the world in the absence of worship because man desired equality with God. Sin resides in the void that worship left. The moment we desired equality with God, we stopped a posture of worship and made room for sin. It goes to say exactly the opposite that when we carry a posture of worship and a lifestyle of worship, we push away sin because we fulfill the very reason we are here. So let me take you back to God's original plan and purpose. I want you to lift your eyes and realize why you breathe. Ephesians 1 verse 12, God's purpose, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. Verse 14, he did this so we would praise and glorify him. The only, the whole world is asking the question, why am I here? What's the reason for living? What's the purpose for life? Christians are trying to discover it. And the enemy hates you discovering the fact that you were created because God wanted worship from you. God puts his very breath inside of us and creates us to worship him and we choose to rob him of that worship and desire equality with God. And in God's love, he sends Jesus to come and die on behalf of our sins so that he could breathe his last and we could breathe our first again in worship when we choose to receive Jesus. He put his breath in us and we took it away from him by not giving him the worship he deserved. It gets better, it's okay. I'll encourage you in a moment. In his grace, God sends Jesus to pay the price for our sins. So Romans 12, verse 1 now makes a lot more sense to me. It says this, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters, I urge you Edge Church, Adelaide, Melbourne, Bristol, New York, I urge you in view of God's mercy. Pause there for a moment. How merciful is our God? In view of the fact that he put his very breath inside of us, 
that he created us, that we had no life outside of him and he put his breath inside of us and created life in view of the fact that we took that very breath to glorify ourselves rather than glorify God and in view of the fact that even though it was our wrong, he sent Jesus to die on our behalf in view of the mercy of God. Give your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. In view of God's mercy, give your bodies. That word bodies in the Greek is the word soma. It means everything about you. Every dream, every desire, every ambition, every thought, your personalities, your struggles, your victories, everything of your personhood, everything that is you. Give everything that is you. God doesn't want to be a category in our lives. He doesn't want us to give a weekend or a Friday night or a Sunday or even a couple of nights a week. No, that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for every living breath that we take to be given to him in worship. So in my marriage, my marriage worships him. In my parenting, my parenting worships him. In my giving, my giving worships him. In my serving, my serving worships him. In my crisis, when I don't know the answer to the crisis, but I still declare my God is great, my crisis worships him. In my victory, when everyone else wants to put me on a pedestal, I step aside and say, my victory resides only in the greatness of my God. Every living breath exists to bring worship and glory to God. That's what he's looking for. Every breath, every moment, every part of my life, not a section, not an institution, but every part of your life. You were born to worship and the enemy has tried to rob you of your purpose. It's time to take it back. He loses big time tonight. It's time to take it back. Matthew 6, verse 9, Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray. Listen to the, in the context of the purpose of worship. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Start with worship. May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth, not as it will be in heaven, as it is in in heaven what's happening in heaven all the angels are worshiping him and he's saying start this is the way I want you to pray no vain repetitions no religious practices this is not about you and how good you are and how many times you say this he's actually saying no just start with this, may your kingdom come, may your will be done, worship him, hallowed be your name, and may your kingdom come on earth, may your people begin to worship you in the same way that the angels worship you, that at every breath they declare holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, he's teaching us something of our purpose, pray this way, get to your purpose, discover what God has for you, we pray that the worship intended for the Father would now happen on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, and mankind, this is where it starts to turn up. Mankind worships in a way that no angel can. Because mankind worships from a place of knowing brokenness and shame and pain and crisis, and yet we still worship him. Oh, whenever God replaces something, it always goes higher. A third of heaven's angels disappear and God creates mankind and says they will worship me. And in their brokenness, they will worship me. They will worship me in a way that no angel can worship me. And if we would just give him his breath back, if we would just give him this life back so that we could actually create worship in a way that brings glory and honor to God, is it any wonder that God inhabits the praises of his people? Because he says, I stay away when they don't fulfill their purpose because I can't coexist with sin. I can't coexist with the people that won't worship me. Oh, but when they begin to worship me, when they begin to declare in my marriage, God, I'm going to do it your way. In my parenting, God, I'm going to do it your way. In my finances, God, I'm going to do it your way. In my career and my decisions about my future, God, I just want every part of my life, my crisis and my victories to give glory to you. Oh, when we begin to live in praise, he says, that's where I created them. That's why I created them. And I'm going to go right into the middle of that. I need to inhabit their marriage. I'm going to inhabit their home. I'm going to inhabit their business. I'm going to inhabit their future. I'm going to inhabit... Is anybody getting this? 
Oh, he inhabits the praises of his people. You and I were not created to do ordinary life. You weren't created for balance. You weren't created to do things. You weren't created to have God as a category or someone on a shelf that you call upon when you have a need. No, you and I were created with breath in our lungs so that every decision, every moment, every thought, every action would bring glory to him. Oh, I love this because it changes everything. Oh, when we restore back to God the worship he created us for, we restore it in a way that's greater than the original. Oh, it's so good. Now allow me to show you why on earth I would say this at the launch of a theme called One. A couple of years ago, Pastor Robert Ferguson from Hillsong Church in Sydney gave Pastor Danny a word. He said, I want you to go home. I want you to look into Ezekiel chapter 37. And it will unfold and unpack. And began to share out of Ezekiel 37. In Ezekiel 37, we'll read from verse 1 to verse 14. It's a prophetic picture of God's people. And it's a valley full of dry bones. And God takes Ezekiel and places him in the middle of a valley full of dry bones. Showing that God's people were dead. They were exposed to the elements. They were dried out and without life. And he brings them into the middle of that. And he says... Can these bones live? God says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, only you, sovereign Lord, know. He says, then prophesy. God's looking for a generation that will prophesy life over dead things. He's looking for someone that would look at the dead things and begin to declare life over them again. Because God's people will come to life. So many people prophesying doom over the church. So many people prophesying that the church is dead, that the church has no life, that the church won't see miracles, that the church won't see breakthroughs. But God is looking for someone that would dare to believe. And they did, and he dared to believe, and he prophesied. And what happens? The bones came together as... And flesh and blood formed and skin formed, but yet there was no life in them. Because we could have the form of a body, but without the breath of God, we have no life. So he says, now prophesy to the four winds. And the winds come and the breath of God comes in them. And it says, they rose up a mighty army as one when we come together as one we position ourselves for the breath of God to come again so that we could rise up and come back to life to come back to life means to be revived and we've prayed for so many years about revival but revival will break out when God's people come together as one and put aside their differences and put aside their opinions and walk as one and obey as one and know as one and the bones and I'm here to prophesy that the breath of God is going to come to our church as we come together as one and revival is going to break out over our church and it's not just going to be hype there's power in our one and two years ago we were told that this was going to happen I can't orchestrate this God speaks to me about the breath that he wants to bring back to the church but it can only come when we come together as one power of one is that we position ourselves for God to breathe. Now fast forward time and let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2. Is this helping you? Oh, Because in a moment in Melbourne I'm going to hand over in a moment to the guys and in a moment I'm going to get the worship team back. Maybe if you start to come back now that'll be great. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. On the day of Pentecost all the believers were meeting together in one place. That's why you can't, I'm sorry for those that are watching on DVD, you can't experience what this is like unless you're here together as one. We're, not where brethren talk about being one, where brethren dwell together as one. This is why our encounter nights in the next few weeks are going to be so powerful and what God is going to do in the next few moments because it's not about me. It's about us as one. They were dwelling in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. This is so misunderstood. Stay with me. At the time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. 
When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. And it goes on to list all of the nations there. Skip down to verse 11. It says, and we all hear these people speak in our own language. What about? About the wonderful things God has done. Oh. We make it about our own encounter. We make it about Pentecostalism. But it is about an encounter with the Holy Spirit that doesn't, stay with me, doesn't bring confusion to our community. Doesn't cause them to stumble over what on earth are these people doing. They began to speak a language with the breath that was in them. Their lives began to speak a language the community understood. And they said, these are ordinary Galileans. What on earth? That they're the, that's the person I walked past yesterday. That's the person that's in my workplace. That's the person who went through that crisis. That's the person that had that victory. And the breath that's inside of them that came from God is speaking a language I can understand. And what their life is saying is the wonders of Almighty God. Because when the breath of God comes, it changes our life. So our life begins to bring worship to God. He came a second time with His breath and filled them to overflowing. Oh, I'm sorry if, oh, I shouldn't be shouting. Sorry. I tell our guys to settle down and communicate and here I am going crazy. Sorry. When the breath of God came, the people made a declaration of worship. They didn't confuse their community. They, their lives, see the breath is about life. When breath came, life came. This is not about a moment. We've made it about a moment. No, this is about a transformation of life. That when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, His life comes into us and every part of my life speaks the wonders of God. The Holy Spirit comes in and all of a sudden I get transformed and in a crisis, I speak the wonders of God. In victory, I speak the wonders of God. In my marriage, I speak the wonders of God. In my transformation, I speak the wonders of God. In my repentance, I speak the wonders of God. In my giving, I speak the wonders of God. In my serving, I speak the wonders of God. In every part of my life, Oh, it's so much more than running a church program. Your only purpose for existence is that your life would worship God. That's the only reason we're here. And the only reason He's bringing us to heaven is that forever, every breath inside of us will declare the wonders of our God. That's why the Holy Spirit comes. He doesn't come for us to have a moment. He comes for us to have life so that our life would speak to the community a message of the wonders of our God. God is about to breathe on the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when He does, life will flow and revival will break out and the community will be lining up at our doors not to hear our craziness, but because our lives speak something that every single... Oh, the body of Christ... Every one of you represents a message our community needs to hear. The very reason why you're in your workplace, your school, your family, your community, your football club is because the Holy Spirit's to come on you so that your life would be in the speaker language that they are there going, I get that, I get that. That declares the wonders of God. That is why we don't restrict it to a gathering. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples. The power of the Holy Spirit is not so that we can swim in an experience for a moment and keep gathering here. No, it's so that we can encounter the Holy Spirit, change our lives, have His breath in us, be restored restored to the purpose of worship and live a lifestyle of worship that our community will flock to and want to see revival will break out. Oh, get ready because something's about to happen in this meeting. There in Melbourne and here in Adelaide, something's about to happen. I've prayed for this moment. The Psalmist David considered one of the great worshippers. When you read the Psalms, it's, it's just ebbs and flows. It's ups and downs. His graph would go like this. My enemies surround me. God, where are you? God rescued me. Yet will I praise him. My enemies surround me. God, where are you? I feel like I want to die. God rescued me and I praise Him. Ups and downs all the way through His life. And He concludes His writing. He stops here. 
His conclusive statements in Psalm 150 is this, praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. In other words, praise Him everywhere. Praise Him for His mighty works. Praise His unequaled greatness. Praise Him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise Him with the lyre and the harp. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Oh, who says that this is crazy when we've got musicians? Oh, bring out a lyre and a harp. I don't even know what a lyre is. It's spelt differently to the lyres I know. Praise Him with a lyre and a harp. Praise Him with the ta tambourines. Ben Child right now in Melbourne is celebrating. Me and him got this tambourine thing going. Praise Him with the tambourines and dancing, strings and flutes. Praise Him with the clash of a cymbal. Praise Him with loud clanging cymbals. Oh, Fergie, come on. Oh, let everything that breathes, right? It's the same, it's the same word. It's the same Hebrew word as Genesis 2. Let every one of me, I've got goosebumps all over me. Let everyone that God has breathed this life into declare the praise and wonder of our God. Through the highs and the lows, yet will I praise Him. Let everything that has breath, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let every part of your life, let every part of your marriage, let every part of your home, let every part of your future, let every part of your dreams, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now listen, I don't want to dishonour the musicians because He says to use the musical instruments. I was watching on the plane and as I was flying home, there's a particular documentary called 20 Feet From Stardom. It talks about backing vocalists, some of the best backing vocalists in the world, but they're 20 feet from stardom and they, they step out of their gift and try and go to the front and it doesn't work, right? But that's not the point I'm making. In the middle of it, they talk about the voice and they have this expression of, of what the voice is. And they talk about the fact that the voice is the only instrument that has no additional accessories. It's connected to the very soul of a human being. So when all of this is happening, it comes to a culmination. Cymbals and flutes and lyres and harps and tambourines and dancing. All of it comes to a culmination and God steps in when everything that has breath begins to bring praise to God. Every part of your life is designed to worship Him. Oh, this has changed everything for me. I've started to assess everything in my life. Say, God, is this worshipping you? Is the way I'm thinking about my children worshipping you? Is the way I'm raising my kids worshipping you? Is the way I'm doing my marriage worshipping you? Is the way I use my finances worshipping you? Is the way I do life and dream about the future worshipping you? And that's not just about being a pastor, that's about being a man and being a woman and having breath inside of you. You will only ever find life. The thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. He wanted to take from you, but tonight you've heard a message that actually restores you back to your purpose, back to the plan. Oh, you have breath in your lungs so that you can worship Him with every part of your life. The very life in us is not our own, it belongs to God. And God's vision for the church was that we would come together as one so He could breathe again. That's what the theme of one was. I didn't know this in November. Because God orders the steps. He just gives us one step at a time. And He's unpacked this for us. The purpose of this message is to bring us to a want to. And then discipleship will take us to a how to. Don't miss that. Tonight, tonight is not about trying to work out in my head, well, how am I going to do this with every part of my life? That's what discipleship is for. That's why we want to disciple people into the how to. Tonight is about a want to. I did some in-depth research, which basically meant I typed into Google and I asked how many breaths do we have in a day? And it says that people, depending on their age and their fitness and what they're doing, will breathe between 17,000 and 30,000 breaths in a day. And I ask myself, and I ask you this question, how many will we give back to Him? And how many will we withhold? Because the only time you will find life and life in abundance is when you connect to the very reason you were created. Oh, this is, he makes it about you, but it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about worshiping him. I'm gonna hand back to you, Ben, there in Melbourne. But I'm gonna ask everybody here in Adelaide just to stand to your feet just for a moment. This is, it's the power of one. It's the power of one. 
this is the reason why God called us to come together as one. I, I really feel like jumping off this stage and getting out of the way because there is no way I could have orchestrated this. Can you see church? He's getting his church back. And the church that he wants worships him with every part of their life. I'm going to ask you this question. And I want you to take a moment to think it through. How much will you withhold? And how much are you prepared to give? Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my marriage, we give our everything. As for me and my finances, He can have everything. As for me and my children, He can have everything. As for me and my health, He can have everything. As for me and crisis, He can have everything. As for me and victory, He can have everything. As for me and my future, He can have everything. From this moment, I want His will to be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. And I want every breath. The enemy will not steal one more breath from me. And I don't want him to steal it from you. And I think if we can come together as one over this month, I believe many of you are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. Breath is going to come for a second time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open this altar up. The guys have deliberately pushed the chairs back, which is great. I'm going to open this altar up. And if you want to join me in saying it's everything. You see, I'm not asking you to commit to a Tuesday night discipleship program. That's, that's to lower it. I'm actually saying God wants everything. And if you're prepared to say every living breath, every decision, every part of my life, God, I give it all to you. Then really quickly, I know there's a lot of people in this room. We'll do whatever we have to do. I want you to get out of your seat. And I want you to come to this altar. And I want you to kneel before God. And the guys are going to lead us in worship as we do. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. I want you to make that decision tonight and say, God, that's me. As one, we're going to come together and declare, God, you have everything. Let's make our way right the way forward. All the way forward. God, I give you my everything, my every breath, my every decision, every part of me, my future, my dreams, my desires, my marriage, my children my future, my business, my career, my job, my time, my treasure, my talent. You have it all, God. I'm giving it all to you. Everything that I am. And let everything in this place, let everything in this place, let everything in this place that has breath, let everything that has breath declare the praises of God. Just continue to make your way forward, Greg. Just begin to lead us in this song. I surrender.